Current common sense dictates that our lives are concerned with the pursuit of self-interest and that altruism at best is enlightened self-interest. This assumption has had catastrophic consequences for ourselves as individuals, for the groups we interact with, and for the power relations we participate in. It's intuitively sound to say to somebody that groups succeed when individuals act for reasons that are bigger than their self-interest. The measure of the success of a company, for example, is the profit or the surplus that it produces. By definition, a surplus only exists because the people who are cooperating in the enterprise produce something bigger than what they collectively took out. In other words, they gave more than what they took. The issue is that people actually think that when they act for reasons that are bigger than their self-interest, they're busy cutting their own throats. And when they're acting in their own self-interest, they are doing what is good for them. In truth, exactly the opposite is the case. When you ask people what they want out of life, you always get a bag of words that have got four themes in them. Firstly, there'll be a theme around security. It's important to feed my family, to have a roof over my head, to pay the bond. And then there's a theme around fulfillment. It's important to have a sense of learning and challenge. There'll also be a theme around significance or power, that it's important for me to be recognized by others. And there'll be a theme around harmony. Security, fulfillment, power and harmony. And they think that to pursue their own immediate self-interest is the best way to get those four things. What they don't realize is that those four things are the product of acting on the basis of everybody else's interest rather than your own. Every moment that you're in, you're always faced with two issues. There's a set of issues that are concerned with what you want to get from the world and a set of issues that are concerned with what you're giving to the world. If you base your security on what you're getting from the world, you'll never be secure. Whereas if you base your security on the basis of what you're contributing or giving, You've always got control over that and you'll therefore always be secure. And the asset that best demonstrates this is a house because a lot of people think that security is wrapped up with owning a house. The brand promise of security is that it promises to make you secure. It promises to stand between you and catastrophe. Like your house is going to do that. If somebody beats you to a pulp today as you're going home, I don't think your house is going to say, Caroline, who beat you up? On the other hand, if you walk up to your front door and see that the neighborhood hooligans have sprayed a red X on your door, you'll probably be annoyed. So are you there to look after the house or is the house there to look after you? You can make a very solid argument to say that the more assets you own, the less secure you are. So your security is never based on what you have or get. Your security is based on what you are able and willing to give. Exactly the same argument has to be true for happiness and fulfillment. If my happiness is based on what I'm getting from the world, I'll be discontented. If my happiness is based on the quality of what I'm contributing, because I've always got control over that, I'll be fulfilled and happy. The implication of this to power becomes very obvious if you consider what happens when you want something from somebody else. Say you want somebody's watch. Clearly, their ability to withhold the watch gives them power over you. So if you want something from somebody else, their ability to withhold what you want gives them power over you and makes you manipulable. Whereas if I want to give somebody something, what I'm trying to give to them, they have no power over. In other words, my weakness is based on what I'm getting from somebody and my power is based on what I'm willing to give or lose. This is true in any context. It's true in any transaction. This has implications for harmony too. Your ability to withhold your watch gives you power over me. You can manipulate me and that makes you dangerous to me. But not only are you dangerous to me, but precisely because I'm trying to get something out of you, I'm dangerous to you. So while I want the watch, you are dangerous to me and I'm dangerous to you. And because we are dangerous to each other, we are going to have conflict. On the other hand, if I shift my intent in the engagement from what I'm trying to get from you to how I can be helpful, then first of all, you can't withhold the watch, so you lose your power over me and I'm safe from you. But precisely because I want to be helpful to you, you're safe from me. And if I'm safe from you and you're safe from me, we have harmony. So what we have to understand is that things that we try to pursue in our lives, which is security, fulfillment, power, and harmony, are actually based on the intent to give unconditionally. The more you construct your intent on your engagement with the other, on the basis of serving them or acting in their best interest, the more you earn those four fruits of life. So there isn't this contradiction between the social good and the individual good. It's the same thing. When people act on the basis of their immediate self-interest, they are producing an experience of the world which is hostile to them. They're acting in conflict with the world. They are discontented and insecure. Whereas people who are doing the opposite, they achieve the opposite. Now the question is, what does that mean for relationships of leadership in the world? When we ask people to define leadership, they normally say something consistent with the idea of achieving a result through people. The intent of that statement is clearly to take. The implication is that people are the means. Now, if I'm using you as a means to achieve something from you, clearly I'm out to get something from you. 
So the current take on leadership is that they are there to get things out of subordinates. If you ask people intuitively to construct an ideal boss, they will say a boss who's kind, who's approachable, who listens, who's supportive, who's honest, who's fair, and who gives me an opportunity to learn. What you get is a huge bag of words, but there are synonyms in that bag, and you can distill them to two core themes. The first is concerned with care. What the subordinate is actually saying to the boss is, have a genuine interest in me, don't just be in this relationship to get something out of me care about me. But then there's a harder theme. If you're looking for someone who is honest, they won't always be nice. Sometimes they'll say things that are upsetting. The reason why you want the honesty is because it helps you to understand where you are and what you can learn and therefore how you can grow. So the two themes that come out of this ideal boss is care and growth. These themes are universal. We found them from Japan among employees in gold mines in South Africa in military organizations. Wherever you go, every human being on the planet says, the boss I work for because I want to, cares for me sincerely, and gives me an opportunity to grow. If you work for somebody because you really want to, because they do all those things for you, if that person asks you to do something, you'll probably do it, which means you give that person the right to ask you to do something or to exercise power over you which suggests that these criteria of care and growth are the universal criteria for legitimate power. The first relationship of power you have with another person in your life is with your parents. And there are two people in that relationship. There's a big one and there's a little one. The job of the big one for the little one is very specific. It's care and growth. In other words, the job of the big one for the little one in any relationship of power is care and growth. Now that requires a shift in the intent of the boss from the big one, from being here to get something out of the subordinate to being here to give something to the subordinate. What care and growth requires of people in command relationships is that they invert how they view their jobs. Their role isn't to achieve a result through people. Their role, and it sounds bizarre, is to achieve people through results. And very often people in executive positions say you've just left the planet, you're smoking your socks, and that doesn't make sense. If you think about it, however, that's exactly what a good coach does. A bad coach walks to a team and says, my job as a coach is to achieve a result, and I'm going to use you, Mr. Athlete, as my resource to do that. In fact, it is the athlete's job to produce a result. The coach's job is to care for the athlete and to grow the athlete. That doesn't mean to say that the coach loses interest in the job. Clearly, he watches what happens on the field and what happens on the scoreboard because those things are his job. Those things are his means to do his job, which is to coach the athlete. He literally uses the job as the means whereby he produces an athlete. His product is an athlete. Until people in command relationships, whether it's in the state, whether it's in corporates, whether it's in enterprises, understand that their product is the people working for them, we will stay in crisis. We will continue to turn the forest into chopsticks. We'll continue killing off frogs in Canada. We'll continue eating up this big cheese we're sitting on until there's nothing left. We have to change this insanity of thinking that self-interest is the way to pursue our well-being as a species. The pursuit of self-interest destroys you as an individual. It destroys the groups that you're working in, and it completely undermines the legitimacy of relationships of power in any establishment.